Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host Titus and today I am joined by renowned critic Terry Teachout for a discussion of Hitchcock's Vertigo this year on its 60th anniversary. I am very pleased that you could join me, sir, and I have been long looking forward to talk about this movie, and this anniversary is as good uh, an excuse as any. Thanks for taking the time, and please introduce yourself for our audience and tell us your history with the movie. Yes, I am Terry Teachout. I'm the drama critic of the Wall Street Journal and the critic at large of Commentary Magazine. I also write for the stage and direct for the stage. I've written two plays uh, that have both been produced. One of them, Satchmo at the Waldorf, has been done from coast to coast. I've written three opera libretti, several biographies and books, and my cultural interests range very widely. I write about theater every week, but I really do write about all of the arts, and film is something with which I've been fascinated and preoccupied my whole life long. And Vertigo is a film that I first saw when I was far too young to see it. Uh, I saw Vertigo for the first time in 1966 on television, when it was aired in primetime on NBC's Saturday Night at the Movies, the only time, so far as I know, that it was ever shown on network television. I was 10 years old. 10 is too young to be seeing Vertigo. And yes, it left quite a, quite a mark on my psyche. Hitchcock pulled the film from circulation two years later for financial reasons, and so the next time I or anyone else saw it was after his death, when it was re-released theatrically in 1983. Uh, It first became available on home video after that. I acquired a VHS uh, version of it. I saw the restored version of Vertigo in New York in 1996 at the Ziegfeld Theater. That's the last time I've seen Vertigo in a theater, but I couldn't tell you how many times I've seen it in my life. It is a film with which I, and really, I think most everybody with a serious interest in film, is fascinated, uh, as I'm sure many of your listeners know. Uh, Vertigo actually topped Citizen Kane for the first time in the 2012 Sight and Sound Greatest Films Critics Poll. So Vertigo's standing as a film has only increased since it was released, tremendously so since it became available on home video, which of course worked the great revolution of perception and understanding of film. Suddenly, films became art objects that we could revisit regularly and consider. And Vertigo is a film sufficiently rich that it not only profits from, but I think demands uh, multiple viewings. Otherwise, you're just not going to get everything that's there. It's no surprise to me. It was greeted very equivocally by critics and by the public on its original release in 1958. Hitchcock at that time, as you know, had a reputation as being an entertainer, a maker of thrillers. They were, of course, or at least many of them were much deeper than that, but they were thrillers. They were aimed at a popular audience. And Vertigo is a very different kind of film. I cannot imagine what people thought of it who saw Hitchcock and thought of, uh, I don't know, not even Rear Window, which is also a rather obsessional movie, but the more popular films that he had made. It must have just hit them like a thunderbolt. And of course, it did me too when I was 10 years old. It's strange to think that it's been around all those years, that my own experience of it is now more than 50 years old. It is a classic, but it is a very odd classic, a very idiosyncratic one. And uh, I myself don't even think it's Hitchcock's greatest film, so maybe that might be a place to jump into actually talking about the thing itself. Yes, I agree. I don't think it's the best. I don't think it's my favorite, but it's one that I've thought a lot about because it has certain unique features. One of them is that the protagonist is not the good guy. It is unique that James Stewart would play a bad guy, a certain kind of bad guy. He's not a villain. He is not a monster or a very wicked person by any stretch of the imagination, but he's not a good guy, which Jimmy Stewart had always been. And Stewart's presence in the film is, I think, its defining element, and in a way, it's one of the masterstrokes of the film. Because in 1958, most people saw James Stewart as America's good guy. He was identified time and again in a long string of films. And yet, we who have the vantage point of hindsight know that immediately after the war, he served, of course, as a bomber pilot. Uh, and by his own testimony, experienced tremendous transforming fear in the air. And he talked about how he brought that into his work, into his acting after the war. He made several films, particularly the westerns that he made with Anthony Mann, also called Northside 777, 
films in which you really see Stewart, if I may choose a lesser metaphor, in touch with the dark side. Even in It's a Wonderful Life, which we mostly see as a happy Christmas film, that is actually a very dark film in which he gives a startlingly dark performance. So it was incredibly astute of Hitchcock to cast a man who was seen as a good guy, but whom Hitchcock, who watched movies and knew what was going on in them, would certainly have known was quite capable of showing the incredibly dark and, and troubled feelings that Scotty Ferguson feels and experiences in Vertigo. If it had been cast with anybody else, it would have been less effective. And it's in part because of the star system, because of the baggage. Baggage is not the right word, but the experience that everybody who saw Vertigo in 1958 brought to it. And now people who know Stewart's work bring to it. If you don't know anything about Jimmy Stewart, obviously, and you see Vertigo for the first time, it's not going to hit you that way. But if you've seen more than one or two of his films, you'll have an idea of what it's like. And you'll watch it and you'll shake your head and say to yourself, my God, Jimmy Stewart? Doing this? It's quite a thing. Yes, and it's interesting to think in such case about what it means to be a star. The performance on the screen is part of it. The other part is the reputation, which is also present there. And his good guy demeanor and his sort of Indiana accent begin to sound different in the second part of the movie. Those intense blue eyes become very disturbing. And in some ways, this had always been there but not obvious, and they had never taken center stage. They had never become the thematic elements of a characterization of a performance. Before I saw it, I had no idea he had it in him. Only in hindsight do I recognize that. Some of this I've seen before. I've seen him get angry before, but I never thought it could go farther. And so, yes, it was an astute choice by Hitchcock, and it was one of these startling things, like, in a very different sort of way, it's like Howard Hawks understanding that the best way to use Cary Grant is to make fun of him and eventually put him in drag. Yes. That's not what we would think. He was the star, the most beloved man in the movies. But it makes perfect sense if you think about what a comedy is. So also with Vertigo, the more you take seriously the weirdness and the touch of horror, the personal madness, the more you realize it makes perfect sense that it says something true about the character and that it uses the reputation of the star to give a certain depth of feeling that would be impossible. We wouldn't take seriously a bad guy in that role, somebody we're willing to say is a bad guy or a villain, because we would have no emotional connection to him. We would not be joining him for the ride into ever more disturbing madness. Yes, that's exactly right. The genius of the studio system, in a way, is that for those who want to use it that way, when they are working with the star, that they can play against type. They can cast a, a Charles Boyer in Gaslight. Uh, they can cast Stewart in the obsessional roles of the westerns that he did with uh, Anthony Mann. I'm thinking of Winchester 73. The, the, the staggering scene where he's in the bar with Dan Durier, who says something uh, unwise, and Stewart slams his face down in the bar, an action that you just don't expect to see from our Jimmy Stewart. Part of what makes Stewart so fine an actor, and I think you can make a strong case that he may well have been the single greatest actor of the Hollywood studio system, the greatest male actor, is that he's willing to step outside the line that he's willing, like a great actor does, to draw on this transforming experience that he had in the war, to put it into those roles, to be very raw and shocking with it. Actors who are concerned about their reputations don't do that. But he was concerned with the work, with the performance, and that's what an artist does and is. And of course, taking risks means losing some of the time, and the movie was a failure at the time. It ended Stewart's relationship with Hitchcock, and it shocked Hitchcock to some extent as well. He hadn't had a failure since his four successive failures in the late 40s, early 50s, and the 50s were the great age of his successes, but then this came along. His next movie, of course, was North by Northwest, a charming movie, a successful movie, a thrilling movie, something you love to be scared I, by. It's no. actually his best movie, uh, the one in which he's truest to himself. But in Vertigo, he is trying to go beyond what we expect of Hitchcock, beyond the, exactly. the glamorous terror, perhaps you might put it. In a sense, put it this way, in Vertigo, Hitchcock is trying to make a genuinely serious, tragic movie. How often can you say that a Hitchcock film is a tragedy? Earlier in his life, you couldn't say it at all. Everything always worked out in the end. 
nothing works out in the end in vertigo. It ends in death and terror and with the assumption that the next thing that's going to happen after the fade out is that Stuart himself will jump off the bell tower. Or if he doesn't, uh, he'll go back to the asylum. He is ruined as a person. That's much deeper than anything Hitchcock had tried. He implies this kind of subject matter in Shadow of a Doubt, which is before that, I think, as close as he comes to this level of tragic seriousness. But Shadow of a Doubt resolves in the way that we want it to. Vertigo doesn't. It resolves in the way that a tragedy resolves. And that was not a product that the film-going audiences of 1958 wished to see, and least of all did they wish to see it, out of Jimmy Stewart. Yes, and you have a very good phrase, glamorous terror. Vertigo also uses glamour to great effect, precisely to show that it's somehow tied up with tragedy. As the Greeks would say, the god of war and the goddess of love are married. Beauty and terror are inevitably tied up. Well said. And recently, I read an essay by one of the editors at First Things, Matthew Schmitz, who talked about the movie in terms of a gothic story, and he very astutely pointed out what a great opportunity San Francisco offers. It has both a romantic pre-American past, which Hitchcock uses to great effect, the Catholic missions and churches and mission architecture, but also the pre-American, the old world glamour of aristocrats and the three times repeated the phrase power and freedom, a regime of inequality where people could be treated horribly by the powerful who were also glamorous while doing it. There are two characters in Vertigo who don't get billing. One of them is San Francisco. The other is the score. And these two things are absolutely essential to the total effect of the film. In a way, I think the setting is more central in Vertigo than in any of other film by Hitchcock. Hitchcock uses pieces of setting, obviously. You know, you wouldn't have North by Northwest without Mount Rushmore. But the city itself, without it, no Vertigo. And also, as Hitchcock knew very well, without that score by Bernard Herrmann, no Vertigo. And I, being a musician, someone who has actually been a performing musician and thought a lot about film scores, it would be interesting to see Vertigo played without the score, or alternatively, with a different, less effective score. Because there are very long stretches of this film in which nobody says anything. We are simply following. Jimmy Stewart is following Kim Novak through the streets of San Francisco from one place to another. No words are spoken. And yet these scenes have tremendous and even frightening dynamism. And the reason why they do is because of the music. Vertigo is a locus classicus of what well-written, dramatically imaginative music can do for a film. Yeah, I am not a music critic or a musician, however, so I cannot speak to the particular qualities of the music, but the suggestion you make, what would it be like without this music, yeah, it would be hard to watch, or alternatively hard to bear in the parts where you are already aware it of would, the terrifying things. It would be dull, and Hitchcock knows that. Yeah. And that's why he gave Herman complete freedom to do what he wanted in these scenes. He understood that he was working with one of the two or three greatest film composers in the history of the medium. And uh, there, as in the next couple of films that he did with him, he was absolutely willing to let Herman take the lead under certain circumstances. Herman's an interesting character. He is a composer who has an extraordinary gift for drama and no gift of melody whatsoever. That made him the perfect film composer because he can create backgrounds that enormously heighten tension, that underline every feeling that the characters are experiencing. But because they are not melodic scores, their appeal comes in exclusively from harmony. They never get in the way of dialogue. They never step on action. And it's the reason why he couldn't write music outside the medium of film that had any lasting value. He wanted desperately to write a great opera based on Wuthering Heights, and he just didn't have the equipment for it. Vertigo is Herman's opera, let's put it that way. It is the one in which he is dealing with the heightened, larger emotions that are the stuff of opera. And Hitchcock lets it fly, above all in the transformation scene, with its quotation from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. Exactly. Everywhere, everywhere in the film, we are seeing opera in which nobody sings. And uh, we don't know as much as we'd like about Hitchcock's own musicality, but we do know from people who talked about it that he went to concerts, he knew a reasonable amount about music, and I suspect, at least in his major phase, that he had the wisdom of knowing what he didn't know, and knowing when he got Herman that he was working with somebody of unusual quality. 
which is why it's so sad that the whole collaboration went bust uh, when Hitchcock was subjected to commercial pressures. And we all know about that, what happened with Torn Cook. But uh, at this point in the 50s, they are working together with the utmost closeness, cooperation, and an almost telepathic understanding each of what the other was trying to do. And the result is one of the half dozen, I would say, very finest film scores ever written in or outside of Hollywood. One that can actually be listened to outside the context of the film. I have not tried that, but I will consider it. It's uh, also an interesting suggestion. The point I would like to emphasize is the tragic dignity and the operatic quality of the score. It serves to hint and at the same time to give consistency and depth to a story that only very gradually unveils its tragic ambition. Compare this to the story Whereas Hitchcock did not involve himself in the music, he had absolute control over the story, beat by beat, and he insisted on characterizing John Ferguson, Scotty, the Jimmy Stewart character, only very subtly. You get hints from him. In fact, it's Barbara Belgeris, his ex-fiancee, who says, He's a man of unusual ambition, a wealthy lawyer, a college guy, and nevertheless became cop. Why? He wants to be chief of police someday. Now, that's just a throwaway joke in one of her many remarks that are jibes at him. Not unfriendly, she's always friendly, but they reveal something about the unusual ambition of the man, which doesn't come across up until you see how obsessive he can be and how interested he is in his moment of weakness and failure once he has to quit the force and thus abandon his dreams. He becomes seduced by other older dreams, darker dreams, and you don't know why that is there. Well, it's there because of his ambition. He has, like any tragic hero, tragic flaw, and without the power of the music, the hints in the characterization would be too sparse. These are things that nobody picks up, I don't think, on the first or even a second viewing. It's only when you see how he ends up that you start asking yourself. Right. Hitchcock has the wisdom of the natural dramatist. Uh, He knows that you don't have to tell everything. You don't have to spell everything out. You can leave it to your actors, to the mise-en-scene, to your composer, if you have a good one, and let the total effect sweep the audience through. Back then, of course, a filmmaker had to operate on the assumption his movie would only be seen once. We had no home video. People didn't characteristically go back to see movies again. I mean, the whole cultural experience of film going was totally different. I like to think, though, that Hitchcock knew that he was making something that needed to be seen more than once. We can't really see into his own sense of artistic ambition. But like Scotty Ferguson himself, he was never more ambitious than in Vertigo. And he backs away from the edge of that ambition after Vertigo in the same way that Scotty does in the last shot of the film. He realized he'd gone too far. Gone too far to make enough money to have his life. Gone too far to continue to have the creative power that he wanted to have. That there were things that he couldn't do as long as he worked in the studio system. And so he never made another film like Vertigo again. And that is perhaps his tragedy. Well, he rebounded and he kept his creative powers. But you're right that like in a tragedy, you see what it means to command all the powers of a studio system. Even ones that aren't obvious. If everybody thought of casting actors against type, there wouldn't be any types left. If everybody thought of finding great composers, great costume designers, great cameramen to work with, then either everything would be more or less as good or there wouldn't be anything that's really, really good at all. He had to summon the entire powers of a studio system, even the ones that were not obviously there, but he used them for a purpose that the studio system had never quite conceived. And he stayed on the tightrope much longer than most directors of his stature did. I mean, when you think of the really appalling career of Orson Welles, somebody who hit the bullseye the first time out of the box and never again had that kind of control for the rest of his life. And you look at Hitchcock, who was able to consolidate his powers gradually over the course of a long and successful career, and then discharge them, I think, completely with Vertigo, and in a different way with North by Northwest, which I think is the comic masterpiece to Vertigo's tragedy, and I think an even better film, but that's another conversation. Vertigo is what it is, and small wonder that he never got to do anything like that again. Maybe it's true that if you have those ambitions and you are working in an essentially commercial factory, like the Hollywood studio system, you only get to do it once. So the trick is to get it right. And Hitchcock, I think, most certainly got it right within his own limitations. 
To me, the problem with vertigo is that it is an obsessional work of art and that it betrays, well, Ingmar Bergman talked about that. He said that watching Hitchcock's films, he saw him as having an infantile psyche. And vertigo is the work of a man who, to put it very mildly, has strange ideas about women strange and obsessional ideas, and who is willing to give them full reign on the screen. That's part of what makes the film so remarkable, that nothing is concealed. If Vertigo is a fantasy, then it's a completely realized fantasy. And it's Hitchcock's wisdom, maybe his self-understanding, that such a fantasy, such an obsession, must issue in death. So that's part of what gives the film its dignity. But that obsessional quality, I think, is what stands in the way of Vertigo's being seen as a supreme masterpiece. There aren't that many of those in film, but for me, the greatest film ever made was Renoir's Rules of the Game. Uh, That's a supreme masterpiece, one which shows us the world as it is and pulls the camera back a bit to provide its context. It's a film about mistaken ideas, but it's not a film about mad obsession. Yes. Uh, that kind of work of art, I think, always limits itself, just in the same way that Michael Powell's uh, Peeping Tom limits itself by being a work about extreme obsession. We want to see these works. We want to go where they go. But I just don't think that that's the course of the greatest art. I don't think Vertigo quite gets up on that level. I would make a case that North by Northwest does in the sense of comic art. It's a comic masterpiece, and it says a great deal about life in the world through the medium of comedy. What Vertigo tells us about is Alfred Hitchcock, and beyond the intrinsic artfulness of how he does it, which is tremendous, how we respond to the film will vary to some degree with how much we want to know about Alfred Hitchcock. And as Bergman said, some of Hitchcock's films tell us things about him that we don't want to know. Yes, I believe that is certainly true. As artists go, Hitchcock really did contain multitudes, but contained them very well most of the time. In his famous interviews with Truffaut, he put it with his usual dry humor that it's a story about a man who, to put it plainly, wants to go to bed with a dead woman. Yes, That is essentially true, but it of course does happen far more than you would think in tragedy. You don't have to look for some particularly sensational, shocking thing in the news. There's more than a little of this in Romeo and Juliet, and they're supposed to be somewhat healthy kids with healthy love. There's more than a little of this in really any tragedy, and it has to do with the character of tragic ambition. Let's bring it into the present moment, too, and we're talking a lot about what male artists do to and with women, and particularly in Hollywood. Vertigo is, at bottom, a film about a man who wants to change a woman, who wants to transform her to turn her into his fantasy. Now, the reason why the film works is because this issue isn't tragedy. What Hitchcock is showing us is that if you do this, it is a terrible mistake, and you will end up with empty hands standing on the bell tower, looking down at blood and death and despair. Yes, Uh, exactly. That's what makes the film work. Nevertheless, it is Hitchcock's own fantasy at work here, and he does have the wisdom to tell us, this won't work, don't do this at home. But nevertheless, that's what's going on here. And that really, I think, resonates with our present cultural moment when women are saying we do not want to be treated this way by men in power. We don't want to be seen as creatures who have to be changed in order to be acceptable. And that brings us to Kim Novak, whose performance is, I think, in a way, almost accidentally great. She is absolutely not a great actor. And if Hitchcock had had his way and was able to cast the kind of woman that he wanted to cast, the film would have come out differently. Yeah, Lana Turner. Right, but the fact that he did cast somebody who wasn't that great an actor, who had an essentially naive and frightened quality, really, again, heightens the effect of the film. Because in no fact, you buy her, especially in the second half of the film. You buy her as somebody who is being worked on in a way that she doesn't understand. She herself, her scale of emotion is not equal to what Ferguson is feeling. And uh, she's terrified, and with very good reason. She ought to be terrified. Flattered as well, but when she realizes that she herself is not acceptable to him. She is only acceptable if she allows him to change her. That's a very disturbing thought. And I think if he'd had a more sophisticated actress who tried to play that, it would have conditioned both her performance and the way that she was directed by him. 
Instead, he has cast a woman who, rather than playing it, is in a sense actually living it. And I gather a woman whom he didn't much like as a person or as a performer. So there was no temptation for him to over-egg the pudding, so to speak. He just put her on screen and let her be herself. And it happens that herself is the right self for this film. The result is the best performance she ever gave in a movie. Yes. In my opinion. And you're, of course, right that Hitchcock himself might come in for a reappraisal because he sometimes treated actresses in a terrible way that damned illegal and scandalous these days. It's just a matter of time before woke critics go after Hitchcock and they're going to use biographical material, some of which is true and frankly, some of which is not. Uh, Hitchcock has not been written about fairly by certain movie biographers who prefer retailing gossip to uh, dealing with primary sources. Nevertheless, all you have to do is look at the films to realize that Hitchcock has these rather strange and obsessional ideas about women. I mean, they come out completely in vertigo, but you see them throughout many of the earlier films, no doubt about it, especially whenever he's got Grace Kelly on the screen. His Belle Ideal, the perfect woman for him, the, the Hitchcock blonde. She had the strength to not be thrown off the track by that. I think she frightened him a bit, and that was good for the collaboration. But with Kim Novak, you have a completely different relationship going on in the work, and I think it's entirely to the advantage of the film. I don't see how you could improve Vertigo without changing it beyond recognition, except for some bad rear projection shots, things like that. <laughs> it's got characteristic flaws. But beyond that, this film is, I think, perfect of its kind. It completely realizes what its maker wanted to do and say. And I don't think he could have done or said it any better than that. I really don't. Yeah. Of course, with Kim Novak, there's also Barbara Bel Geddes there, and they offer a great contrast. Barbara oh, Bel Geddes is an immediately recognizable woman. She's of our time in a way in which Kim Novak's character is not. Oh, she's completely contemporary. And somebody who is not nearly well-remembered enough today. She was an important stage actress, created the role of Maggie in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Uh, and she was the real deal. She has a wonderful part in this, and the whole thing is fascinating. Clearly, the tragedy of Vertigo would not operate if Scotty had what I, as a non-obsessed human being, would regard as the sensible response, which is, grab this girl, she's great, she's just what you want, she's smart, she's an artist, she loves you, she's sensitive and thoughtful, she's everything you want, but you're crazy, and so she won't do and how beautifully she presents this rejection. Her performance is awfully easy to forget because the vector of vertigo is between Jimmy Stewart and Kim Novak, and once it starts to pick up speed, there's no room for anything else. I mean, eventually, Mitch disappears from the film completely after the asylum scene. But boy, does she make an impression before that. She really does. And there's just a million touches in the scenes that she has with him. Yes. She makes her own sexual availability clear to him, not in an obvious way, but it's quite clear. And yet, he doesn't even see her. Yeah, she belongs to modern San Francisco, which also, to a large extent, disappears after the uh, asylum scene. It's yes. Scotty somehow wants to rule the modern world in as much as possible. He wants to be police commissioner of San Francisco. He doesn't want the modern woman, however. There's too much of egalitarianism in her. She not only makes fun of him now and then, but she also tries to mother him, which she emphatically dislikes because he thinks of himself as a man. And as... she makes for her the terrible mistake of revealing that she understands his obsession when she does the painting. Of... Yes. And, you know, you just, you clap your hand on your forehead and think, oh, Midge, how could well, you... Yeah. She's a woman in love, and in a moment of desperation, she too is suggesting in some way she's consenting to being changed into that romantic ideal. But of course, she's not nuts, it wouldn't hold. But she's a woman in love, and eventually it gets the better of her reason. It's... She's also, to use a Hitchcock phrase, she's a woman who knows too much. Yes. She really knows this man. Much of the reason why Scotty is able to get away with what he gets away with with Kim Novak's character, is because he comes from out of nowhere to her. She doesn't know anything about his past. She has no background with him. He is simply the man whom she was used to manipulate. And then suddenly he comes from out of nowhere. And one is always flattered by the loving attention of another person. It takes longer to realize when that attention is somehow deeply misguided or poisonous. 
you can't blame her for putting her foot in the trap. In certain ways, the two female characters are supposed to be similar. They're new in a new world. They're both working, they're both unattached, they're professionals, and they have heads on their shoulders. But they do have certain differences of character. Kim Novak is portrayed as the typical young pretty girl trying to make it in Hollywood. This is, she's of course, San Francisco, but she's a girl from Salina, Kansas, who went... Also be- portrayed as being just a little bit cheap. And again, yeah. that really resonates with the Kim Novak of screen. I mean, she always plays roles like that. She's good at it. It obviously speaks to something in her own character. And Midge is in no way cheap. She is actually a pearl of great price. Yeah, and that signals the big difference between them, the difference in their confidence. Of course, Kim Novak plays a character who not once but twice is toyed with men of great willpower and great malignity. Whereas Barbara Belgueris, Midge, she plays a woman who has enough confidence to end up heartbroken, shocked, but not ruined because she holds on to her own sense of her worth, her self-respect, and in her case, her intelligence, her smarts. Yes. It's not that she is not in love, it's that she's less blinded by it and in certain ways less needy. She knows the town, she knows what she wants to do with herself to a larger extent and that grounds her in a way that is not possible for Judy or Madeleine for the Kim Nova yeah. character because she's not even from there. She came there to pursue fantasies. What can a pretty girl do in sunny California? Well, her vulgarity or poverty, such as it is, is a sign of vulnerability, of neediness, of aspiration. Well, as they say in L.A. Confidential, women like that can either become hookers or actors, and it's hard to tell the difference between the two. That's really what happens to her. What saves Midge, of course, is that she has talent. She has something that doesn't require the approval of a man. She is naturally gifted as an artist and therefore can make her own way. And in your reading of Scotty, which I think actually makes sense, this would probably be something that made her less attractive to him. That she doesn't need him. She does. She wants him. She loves him. And it's really heartbreaking, the asylum scene, where she brings the Mozart recording to him. And she should leave the film at that point, because she's completely said what she has to say. But you think about that afterwards. She will recover from this. She'll never be the same, but she will recover from this. In the unlikely event that Scotty comes down from that tower at the end of the film, he's not going to recover from this. He is doomed. Yes. Of course, he criticizes her mothering, and at the moment when she utterly gives up because she realizes she can't save him, she says, I'll be mother, in another desperate cry of love. But that's, of course, not possible, precisely because he insists on being too much man. That's part of his ambition. Again, their equality jars him, but he is willing to talk to her and get her advice and ask for her help because he recognizes her as an equal. She's someone who can deal with these things. He realizes he's doing something weird and nevertheless, he's willing to share it with her and to get her opinion about it and to ask her help because she's got her own head on her shoulders and he needs help. So that's a recognition of equality, but those are not terms on which he can have love. And you can think again about the difference between the two female characters. The Kim Novak character is, as I said, not once but twice made up to look like a portrait by these men, whereas Midge, the Barbara Belgueris character, she draws her own portrait. Yes. She has a certain critical distance from it, and it has to do with the talent you pointed out. She understands mimesis, imitation. It's not real. She doesn't fall under the spell. And both Midge and Scotty have a certain rationalism in common. Like, at the mission scene, he tries to dispel the insanity, as he thinks of it, of the Kim Nova character. He's in a deceit, but he still plays the rationalist in that. He has fallen. He is much more gullible than he thinks he is. But he still tries to play the rationalist, just like she tries to do it, to cure him or to fix him or to open his eyes. But at least she has her eyes open whereas he doesn't. He really falls for a fantasy. It's not that he loses his mind entirely. The tragedy ends the way it does again because he has unusual powers of intellect. It is the lawyer's part. It is the rational pursuit of justice that leads him to destruction at the very end. He notices something that he shouldn't be noticing. He should be spellbound and completely succumb to the power of the portrait in his mind, but he doesn't. He notices that that necklace from the portrait is out of place on the woman in the real world, and he starts to figure out that he has in fact been played for a fool. 
This doesn't make him any less of a fool, it makes him a doomed fool. But it shows that the rationality and the power of observation and intellect is still there in his madness, which is of course what makes him dangerous. Much of what we're talking about arises from the screenplay itself. And we know a lot about Hitchcock's working methods. He's starting with source material, a novel that was in fact written in French with the hope that Hitchcock would buy it and film it. We know how he collaborates with his screenwriters. It's quite closely. He cannot write a script on his own. He's obviously not good with dialogue. I think that had a lot to do with it. He's primarily concerned with structure and with right from the start of the process, visualizing how the screenplay will be made manifest to the eye. And so here you have a film where you couldn't just do the dialogue and have a sense that you had the experience, that the film was about what the people in it say. That's not even close to that. And yet everything that we've been talking about for the last few minutes is implicit in the screenplay. It's planted there. Uh, the storytelling is very precise, very accurate. It's so vivid. We overlook what in an ordinary mystery film would be regarded as outrageous implausibilities because we too are swept into the illusion. I am not one to go for the auteur theory of filmmaking, but Hitchcock's involvement in the screenwriting process of his major films, it goes far beyond what many of the directors whom we think of as important in the studio system would have done. Uh, he is not taking a finished product and directing it. He is completely involved from the earliest stages in creating a screenplay that can be filmed, that can be seen, that must be seen. Yes, you're, you're right. Just like you said, Bernard Herrmann is his own man on his job. Whereas the writers are always under control, the story is plotted and then storyboarded scene for scene and the blocking done scene for scene and even the actors, only his more trusted collaborators were allowed to improvise to some extent. It's particularly interesting with Herrmann because most this is something that people who don't know about the process of filmmaking aren't aware of. But most of the time, film scores are spotted. That means we determine where the music will play by someone other than the composer, the director, the music editor. I mean, someone else is involved with it. Uh, Hitchcock had a lot to do with the spotting of his scores, but he was also absolutely willing, until things got bad uh, in the 60s, to trust Herman to say, okay, we really need to let her rip here, or we need no music at all here, as in the crop duster scene in the North by Northwest, or to say, both of them together, all right, the music is now going to become the primary storytelling agent, as is true at the end of the transformation scene. That's all about the music. And I would venture to say, it takes a very confident director, confident both in the quality of his collaborators and confident in his own powers to say, as we know that Hitchcock said, all right, Mr. Herman will have something to say here. And Herman comes back with the love scene music from Vertigo. Uh, you don't do that with a collaborator unless you're sure of yourself as well. And uh, in 1958, at the peak of his powers, he knew that he could relinquish that kind of creative control to his great collaborator because it would be used in the service of a film that was totally determined by him. And it's a certain recognition as equals that the man will know your mind and he will also be able to fit the bill. That's indeed incredibly rare, this level of trust. Yeah, I mean, Hitchcock collaborated with some other good composers, and some of his other films have good scores. Roy Webb's score for Notorious is quite good. Some of what Dmitry Tiomkin wrote for him was good as music. But he never had anybody like Herman in a film over which he had complete artistic control. Obviously, he collaborated with Miklos Rocha, who was one of the other great film composers on Spellbound. But that is a film in which there is another big foot in the process, David O. Selznick. So neither one of them is working at their full capacity. And Herman's exactly the right composer for Hitchcock, too, because they are both romantics. That's the key to both of them. They're both extreme romantics, but romantics who are chastened, who know that the world does not always look well on romanticism. And that's what gives you the power of this film and this score as well. Let us not forget, Vertigo is a powerful romantic statement, but it's a one with a very unhappy ending because it's rooted in fundamental illusions about the nature of women. Yes, uh, and that's, I guess, what you'd call a true romance, one that tells the truth about the inevitable consequences of chasing these illusions to the bitter end. I think this is an important insight, his romanticism, because this is also what allowed him to make such movies in an American setting. 
you wouldn't assume off the bat that post-war San Francisco is the setting for this sort of psychological conflict. No. And it is precisely because as artists, they had an awareness of what heartstrings move in such circumstances that they could see it in the world around them, even in this modern world that is far more on science, far less on romance, far more on being practical or pragmatic, far less on idealistic chasing of fantasies to doom. But the elements are still there. They're all still the last time I was in San Francisco, I spent some time visiting Vertigo sites with a friend of mine who at that time actually played organ at the church where the graveyard scene takes place. It's fascinating to see it, to also see how Hitchcock changed his locations through very careful editing and special effects. I mean, the most famous one, of course, is in the last scene where the bell tower doesn't, in fact, exist. It's created by matte painting. I have never understood why an artist who was so sensitive to the visual aspect of his films was so sloppy about certain aspects of them, most particularly rear projection, which he always muffs. Uh, it's not as obtrusive in Vertigo as it is in some of the others, but I, you know, I guess we all have to have our flaws, and uh, Hitchcock has them like every other great artist. Yeah, they speak to some extent to what he thinks is important, to where his attention is really keen and his eye on failing. And in other cases, like next year, we can do a conversation about North by Northwest, which has yes. car scenes that are hilarious. And mostly it works. Strangely enough, they achieve their intended emotional effect. But yes, technically speaking, <laughs> you wonder at it. I can't help but wonder whether people noticed these things back in the 50s when they were seeing these films projected on large screens. Yeah, I also now, wondered that. Yeah, nowadays, most of us see Hitchcock films. Many of us have never seen them ever on a large screen. Vertigo is a great movie. Any way you see it is a good way to see it. But until you've seen it on a large screen, in a theater, in a darkened room, with an audience, you're not fully getting what it is. And I remember very clearly what an overwhelming effect the film had when I saw it in 1983 at the Ziegfeld in New York on a huge screen with a huge audience. And what Robert Warshaw calls the immediate experience of the film was heightened to an overwhelming degree by this increase of scale. It's the thing that younger connoisseurs in the making of film, they're just not going to get to have this experience very much. And they can't even imagine what they're missing. I think yeah. possibly one of the reasons why Westerns aren't as popular as they ought to be is because they really are conceived for projection on a large screen. Yeah, if you want to see just how much grander the world is than the man and what humbling effect it has, the aspect ratio, the size of the screen, these are all necessities. Yeah. Just like, of course, in Vertigo, the combination of the darkness of the theory, Herman's music and the images, they communicate in an irreplaceable way. The power of this spell. Of course, they really you tell somebody the story, the guy's just a cook, or it's just unexplainable that he could lose his mind this way. Well, mm. if you experience it, however, you begin to see how it could happen to a Absolutely. perfectly reasonable guy. Absolutely. They really over-egged the pudding with the restoration as far as the Foley track goes. I remember so clearly how obtrusive the new Foley track Vertigo was in 1983. I understood that they had to do it or something like that, but they did go too far. Hitchcock would never have tolerated that, I don't. But it's a defect of a virtue. Uh, the important thing is the film now survives in a version in which its color values are intact, recognizable. Vertigo looks like it's supposed to look. For the most part, it sounds like it's supposed to sound. And even if you see it on your television at home, if you're really paying attention, if you're not multitasking, you are going to get sucked into an experience that this word is rarely appropriate nowadays with art. An experience that will shock you. Vertigo is shocking, but it's not shocking like a thriller. It's shocking like a morality play, like a film that tells us this is what happens to people who have these illusions about women, about life, about love. They end up looking down from the edge of the bell tower, knowing that there's nothing left for them but to jump. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that the movie will get exactly the reaction it should. Of course, very few do. But on the other hand, if you had to bet that in the digital future, people will pay attention to something, stop multitasking, be sucked into something, and even get a sense that there is something serious here. You learn something about yourself and about human nature. Then this is the sort of movie I would recommend. It has a power to attract and to scare because of what it says about the human heart. 
Yes. It, will, it will last. It has lasted. It is now thought far more highly of than it was when it was released, than it has been at any point in its history. It is admired by craftsmen, by artists, by ordinary people who see it and say, my God, what is this? Vertigo is not going away. And it doesn't diminish its stature for me to say that I don't think it's Hitchcock's greatest film. To yes, say certainly. It has, it's right up there at the top. And it is going to last for anybody who sees the movies as something more than just a ride, as a way of being diverted and entertained. It's a life-changing movie, a perception-changing movie, and one that I come back to every year or two and see more things in it than I did the time before. That's a test of great cinematic art. If you keep peeling the onion and you never run out of layers, there's something great there. I wouldn't hesitate to say that Vertigo is, in its odd, obsessional way, a great film. Yeah, and it fulfills these two criteria. It surprises and attracts enough to add a new audience, but it also rewards reviewing so that when once you see it, you begin to see new things in it and you begin to see that it is, as you say, a morality play, a tragedy. It's a work of poetry and whatever may be the case with auteurs, it's certainly a public good to be able to offer audiences this experience. My history with it also says something about how our experience of film has changed. When I first saw Vertigo panned and scanned on television in 1966, I saw it with no expectation that I would ever be able to see it again. In my lifetime, our relationship to films has changed radically, both through the invention of home video and through the coming of Turner Classic Movies, which I think is, is historically, culturally, the most important development other than home video uh, in the past half century. We now can experience films as art objects, which absolutely presupposes that they can be experienced repeatedly. They weren't made that way, but some of them have proved to have lasting power. In my lifetime, I remember the first time I bought a VCR. I actually remember the first uh, movie I bought on video cassette. It was Rules of the Game. I bought films because they were films that I knew I had to see more than once. And I grew up in places that didn't have revival houses, so you really were completely at the mercy of television. And if that cultural transformation has benefited any film, it's benefited Vertigo, uh, which is now thought to be a masterpiece and was not thought to be a masterpiece when it was made or for many, many years afterwards. So uh, my salute to TCM, my salute to the inventors of home video, you have changed the way in which we relate to films. And you yes, have made these two are public to, goods. Possible for us to understand a film like Vertigo in a way that I couldn't possibly have hoped to understand it when I saw it in 1966. On which note, I think it's about time to wrap up. This is fun to talk about this remarkable movie with somebody who has looked at it as closely as I have. I mean, uh, how often do we get to talk about films in this kind of detail on Twitter? That's right. That's right. Yes, I should tell our audience, I have encountered you in no other way the, except on Twitter before That's this it. conversation, but it's always a pleasure to exchange notes, as it were, as ships by night, sending a few messages of things we found worthwhile about art. But you're right that now it is possible for people to get access fairly easily to tremendous works of art. At this point, we're not as desperate of losing things. Like so many movies have been lost physically. Yes. Now we're only in a position where we have to curate them carefully. And this is what I hope we are doing giving people who have already seen the movie some new ideas and giving people uh, a reason to see it who haven't seen it yet. I know I have been stimulated by this conversation and obviously the next thing I want to do is go back and watch Vertigo again. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time and all the best. My pleasure entirely. A pleasure to meet you electronically through Skype. Same here, sir. Thank you for listening to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus. You can follow me on Twitter at TitusFilm. You can find our podcast on iTunes. And please take a minute and give us a review and a rating. It very much helps share our podcast with a broader audience. We are also on SoundCloud, on Stitcher, on Pocket Casts. You can always find us as American Cinema Foundation. Until next time.